time where our country is more diverse than ever and more divided than ever. What is the gospel? This isn't just good news for us, it's good news for the world. And so when we care for the world, we care for issues that impact the world. When we study the gospels, we learn about Jesus' favorite themes. And clearly his favorite theme was God. The only way you really discover the good stuff of the kingdom is when we let God break apart our mediocre assumptions. For too long, we've preached a cross that is too small. We want the word of God to be proclaimed in a way that people can listen and be changed for his glory and the building of his kingdom. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a Seminary Now Live event. You are rocking with your boy, Jonathan Brooks, Pastor Jay. Um, and we are here to celebrate, I think, as well as learn together um, about Christian community development and church-based community development. Like I said, I'm Jonathan Brooks. Uh, I'm a co-pastor in North Lawndale at Lawndale Christian Community Church. Um, and I too have a seminary now course in case you haven't had a chance to look at it. And that one's called Church Forsaken, Practicing Presence in Neglected Neighborhoods. But um, what we're here to talk about today is a new seminary now course, uh, which is on church-based community development, taught by my fellow co-pastor, my brother, Wayne Coach Gordon. Um, this course really talks about the disparities that we see in communities and how churches can live out Christian principles and see real change in our communities. Um, so, Coach, as you see right next to me, my brother, we're pastoring at Lawndale Christian Community Church together. He's also uh, one of the founders of the Christian Community Development Association and author of several books as well. Uh, Making Neighborhoods Whole, Leadership Revolution. And both of those are co-authored with our friend and our mentor, Reverend Dr. John Perkins. So um, this live event is presented uh, not only by Seminary Now, but in partnership with Northern Seminary, where I was a student, a Perkins scholar, and got my mm -hmm. Master of Divinity and now in school to get my Doctor of Ministry, but also where Coach leads the Christian Community Development programs there um, and uh, in partnership with CCDA. So. Coach, hey. welcome, 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 yeah. welcome. Well, it's uh, great to be with you, uh, Pastor Jay, on Seminary Now. And, and as you just mentioned, uh, we're, we're in this exciting phase here at Lawndale Community Church, uh, where I've been the pastor here for now. This is my 45th year, but that Pastor Jay came on and uh, about a year ago, he's been with us about a year and a half now. And about a year ago, uh, Pastor Jay joined me as co-pastoring. And uh, our church is already, the, we're talking about the church, but I think we need to think about the church and what's going to happen when pastors leave and things. And so we've been working on that here in Lawndale quite a bit. And uh, Pastor Jay has already been voted in as the pastor of Lawndale Community Church when uh, I uh, officially am gone and we are pastoring together now. We're better together. And so we're we're doing Christian community development here. So Pastor Jay, great to be with you. In fact, you know, full disclosure, we were together about we we spent a lot of time together. We were together about three hours this afternoon, and we just love to talk about that. We love the church, and that's why it's so significant today that we're going to talk about uh, church-based community development, what we as the church can do, and and, and important. We're going to think a little bit about some of the theologies. Uh, that that often are not talked about in the broader church in the United States, in America, in the Western world. And so hopefully to tonight we'll spend some of that time. We want to get to your you know questions. If you have some questions, pop them in. Pastor Jay will make sure we get to them because we want to talk about things that you want to talk about. And we'll get into that in, in just a minute. But it's so good to be with you. And uh, we love seminary now. Uh, there's so, so many great things. I love being a professor at Northern Seminary. Um, and directing the doctoral program in Christian community development, as well as the master's program. We've got some fantastic students and we're, we're just excited about all of these things. But most importantly, the thing I want you to know, there's two things I want you to know. I love Jesus Christ and I love being a follower of Jesus. And secondly, I love being a pastor. 
And I've been the pastor of the same church now in, in 45 years. And so um, it's exciting to be uh, in this time uh, in where we are as we're coming out of COVID, the church is as relevant today as it's ever been. Even though maybe people are changing the way things are looking, we've got a theme here at Lawndale now, Pastor Jay probably mentioned that, but that things are different, but they're the same. And uh, what does that look like? And that comes right out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's kind of our year verse this year here at Lawndale that we have different gifts and we have, but it's the same Lord. We have different responsibilities. We have different kinds of service and we have different kinds of working, but it's the same God that gives it to us and it works out. So that was supposed to be just my hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, this is great. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a minute, um, and uh, I'm having a little trouble hearing on my end. So we're going to go straight to uh, take a little break and go to a promo real quick, and we'll be right back to continue the conversation. Church-based community development is looking at God's Word, the Bible, and then striving to live out those principles. God ordained the local church to change the world. Church-based community development is guiding us on how the church can be the church. We're going to deal honestly with, honestly racism, with racism in this course. course. We're going to We're deal, gonna deal with justice, with justice, justice issues, issues and how people and how have been pe treated unjustly. People with the problem have the best solutions to solve the problem. The problem is... We don't listen to the people. I'm Wayne Gordon, and I'm the pastor at Lawndale Christian Community Church on the west side of Chicago, as well as a professor at Northern Seminary. And so I hope that you'll come and take this class with me on Seminary Now. We've got some surprises. I didn't do it all by myself. We've got others that come alongside of me and share about how to do church-based community development. I love the church, for the church is God's change agent of love and the hope for our community. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so, Coach, let's um, let's uh, talk a little bit about a couple of special opportunities we have for people before we get into our conversation. So. First of all, let me just say to everyone, we have two special opportunities today. First, we're giving away a one-year subscription to Seminary Now for a chance to win. All you have to do is live stream on Facebook, and then we will ask you to share it on Facebook, and that will automatically enter you to win. So share this live stream up to 24 hours after the event, and you will be counted in the drawing. So all you got to do? is share, let somebody know that we own, and you could get a year subscription. Secondly, you can sign up to view Coach's course and many other courses at seminarynow.com with a free seven-day trial. Imagine that, free for a full week where you get full access to everything. Or inquire about group subscriptions for churches and nonprofits by emailing sales, S-A-L-E-S, -E at seminarynow.com. All right. So thank you so much. Please share so you can be entered into this uh, into this uh, this giveaway. And then make sure you check out seminarynow.com and, uh, and see if you can get on that free trial. All right. All right. A couple of other household things to take care of before we get started. And then we're going to get started talking to coach a little bit. First, if you have questions, please post your questions for Coach in the chat box at any time during the event. As we get started, just leave a comment now to tell us where you're connecting from so we can know who's on here and where you're at and, and where you're connecting with us from so that we can start knowing who's on here and we can get ready to connect via questions. So whenever you have a question, drop it in the box and we will get started. All right. So first of all, uh, coach, let's just have a little bit of a dialogue and conversation about this. Um, so first of all, when we start thinking about like church based community development, um, what, what do we mean by 
church-based community development? Why is the church so essential? Um, and why do we feel like church is at the core of seeing community development happening? What do you think, Ben? Yeah, well, wow, that's that's such a uh, an important thing to understand uh, in the church. And of course, you know, Jesus. If, if we, if, you know, we love to learn what Jesus did and how did Jesus do things with his disciples. And when you when you read in in the in the Bible, really the first time that church is really truly talked about is in Matthew 16, and that's where Jesus takes his disciples. If you know your geography of Israel, you'll notice that he takes them to Caesarea Philippi, which is up in the northern region, and it's it's way out of the way from what your normal uh, places would be. And so he takes his disciples up there. And on this, if you if you ever visit Israel, be sure you go to Caesarea Philippi because on the side of the mountain there there is there are there were ruins of several different temples to gods. One is the god of Pan. And it's, there's these huge boulders and huge rocks there. Jesus, it's so different than the Galilee plain and very different from Jerusalem. So he takes them up there and he then has this conversation. And, and, and basically he says, who do you say that I am? Now, Peter answers and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. And Jesus says, wow, you've answered this correctly. Do this. That's that's exactly right. But flesh and blood didn't get this to you. There, there was something deeper in it. And then uh, that's when Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon you, I will build my church. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And I think there's some there's some lot of dual meetings, and we don't have time to go into all that. But part of it was that the church is established, and the church is made up of people, of course, like Peter. But also, the church is made up of people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of the Living God, and so we build out on that. So the church builds out on that, and of course, then the church has been here. The church has been here for two thousand years. There's not many things you can think of that have been here two thousand years. Uh, you know, Kodak. We used to Kodak and IBM. These used to be big words. We hardly even hear of Kodak or IBM anymore. Uh, you, you know, I can guarantee you, a thousand years from now, the church will still be here, and you you will still know what the church is, but you know what? I doubt that anybody knows Google a thousand years from now. I doubt that anybody knows Apple other than an apple fruit to eat. So the church is God's change agent. God, Jesus established the church and the church is to go out and to love the community and to love people. Now, when we first started Lawndale Community Church, we had this idea and we were talking about what kind of church and our church, those of you, you can read Real Hope in Chicago. That's another book which kind of tells the story of Lawndale. And it was a group of high school kids that got with my wife, Ann and I, Ann had a Bible study with girls. I had one with boys. And they, I was a coach and teacher at Farragut, and we're they're not they're becoming Christians, but they're not going to church. So we ended up doing a little study of the church. They found out all the things. They we studied primarily the Book of Acts and how they came together. And when people came together, there was church. After we started the church, and you, we, we talk about this, I talk about this in length in one of the seminary now courses on the theology of the church. But I want to get to one point. After we'd been doing it, we took on the motto and the theme of Lawndale Community Church has been loving God and loving people. Right out of Matthew 22, the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so we've been trying to love God here at our church with everything we have, and we've been striving to love our neighbor. But now, one of these high school kids asked Ann and I a question, and they said, okay, if Jesus thinks that we ought to be loving our neighbor, and then listen for this. I wish I'd learned this in seminary, but they said this. They said, don't you think Jesus probably meant that churches ought to love their neighborhood? Amen. We didn't have to think very long. It was like, of course. And then they said, let's be a church that loves our neighborhood. And so then that began us on this journey. Oftentimes, churches are kind of irrelevant to their communities around them. But we are called to love our neighbor. Now, in the city, it's it's probably easier than the suburbs. But I don't I don't want to give suburban people the 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 out. I just don't know the suburbs that well. But in the city, things are really close together. So you know, right across the street from our church, there's there's all kinds of things going on, and we're called to love our community. And so. 
Church-based community development basically means is to go into the community, and we'll look at a couple things tonight, to go into the community and to love the community with the love of God, with the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and develop it means what 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 are what what things do do we need to be a part of? The, the public school system, you know, the police force, the fire department, you know, we need to be people who are building these things up and making them better, not just criticizing them, but helping them to do that. And so I think that that's kind of the basis, uh, Pastor Jay. You you know you you might have and and we're we're in dialogue and you're you're my co guy here today too. Not, <laughs> so you know, you have anything to add? You know, let me ask you the question. You know, do you have anything to add about why churches do community development? What does that mean? Answer your own yeah. question. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I think you've you've covered a lot of it, but at the core, it's believing that God is as concerned about the total flourishing of our place as he is about like individual growth for individual people. And so if that's our reality, if we believe that God is concerned about the total flourishing of our place, then we will make sure that our neighbors, the schools, the hospitals, like all the places that meet the needs and contribute to the flourishing of a place are actually healthy. Um, I love our CEO here at Mondale Christian Health Center. My brother, Pastor James Brooks, always says that an individual can't be healthy until their community is healthy. Right. And I think that's at the core of what we do as a church. Like we, we believe that if there's going to be health um, for an individual, then it's going to be about the whole of their community, their whole neighborhood. And so we want to be contributors. We believe the church is at the center of seeing that happen, seeing that health, that development uh, happen holistically in every area of a person's life, not just their spiritual growth, but mental, physical, right? Like, you know, all of those different ways. And so um, that, that'd that be the only thing I would add is that, yeah, we, we do believe with a change agent along with all of the other partners that we have in our community. And we want to be present in our community and we want to be partnering with as many people as possible to see holistic growth and development happen in our communities. So, yeah, but we believe church is at the center of that. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, and, and, and even in theology of church, which is one of our, one of our, one part of our core uh, on seminary now is theology of the church. And when we think about theology of the church, one of the one of the things that we need to come back, and I think that's one reason we have this course on seminary now, is that, you know, in America, we really have a, a lot of churches are mistaken about what their mission is. And uh, there's a lot of churches that are focusing on one thing, getting saved. You know, and that's not the central message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, salvation is a part of the of the Christian message, but Jesus only talks about salvation in the Gospels about seven times. He talks about the kingdom of God over 50 times. In fact, the central message of Jesus is the kingdom of God. And if we understand kingdom of God, then we understand how a church is to love its community because that's part of the kingdom. We care about everyone. And so that's, I think that the theology is, it is not this gospel of just getting saved. That, 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 that's such a shallow gospel. The gospel is so much bigger. It's for God. Hey, you know, this verse, John 3, 16, for God so yes. loved the world, he loved the world. He loves us that he sent Jesus, and that's the Messiah, and that's the Christ. And when we trust him, then we live for him. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And so when we when we preach a gospel of the kingdom, when we preach the gospel that Christ is, is the central figure and Christ reigns, and we want to have the reign of God wherever, then we, we're concerned about everybody. We're not just concerned about people's souls, and that gives us the word holistic, that we have a holistic. And so Christian community development has eight key components. One of them is church-based. The church is at the center of what we're talking about, being church-based and in Christian community development. But another another one of these ideas is not is that in, in the theology of it is that we're going to care about everybody. We live in the community. We 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 become a part of the community, and we deeply deeply uh, are working to develop discipleship. Comes under development. We're developing people. We develop human beings. We help them to be who God created them to be. So I think that's a that's a big part of the theology of the church that that often is missing in in in, in the in the American church that we get so focused on getting saved that we miss 
the old saying is we're so heavenly bound we're no earthly good i'm sure almost everybody on this uh, uh has heard this heard that before but let's but stop and think about it you know we are called the greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves and as a young person taught us in lawndale we are as a church to love our community so i think that's that's very important part of the church yeah thank you so much that that clarification was one of the things that helped um my theological framework i struggled with this oversimplification of the gospel that was just about people getting saved when i saw so many other complications in the world and i wanted a gospel that had just as much impact about today as it is someday for me. Um, so songs like Some Glad Morning, When This Life Is Over, I'll Fly Away are songs I grew up on, but I wanted something that was gonna change my present you know, situation now. And uh, Christian Community Development is what, it just rung that bell. It helped me recognize that God is concerned with today just as much as someday. Yeah. So thank you for that coach. Um, I think I'd love to talk a little bit um, about some of the differences in your curriculum and your uh, seminary now class than some of the others. And one of the first ones, and it, it was talked about in the trailer, is, is that most seminary now, you get one voice. You get this person who's either written something or lived something or has something to say. But in your course, there are all of these other voices that are sharing and talking and giving great wisdom. Can you talk to us a little about why that was so important and maybe some of who these people are? Yeah, that 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 was I think that's a really important thing. Even when uh, the first major book I wrote was called Real Hope in Chicago and I told stories of people in Lawndale and then when what when I got done writing it, I had the people of Lawndale read it and uh, that's how it got so good because they made all kinds of changes. And so even in talking about church-based community development and one of the things I knew I needed to do is to bring other people in our church involved in that. And so, for instance, you know, there, there's a whole uh, a whole video just on theology of the poor and what does that look like? Well, one of the things that we do in that is that I sit, we're sit down and, and, and seminary now came to Lawndale. So it's all filmed in Lawndale on location. We move several places. We walk down the street. Part of it is sitting in, you know, we, we, we sit on the, my, the front steps of where Ann and I live in our house and people, neighbors just started coming over about how we love our neighborhood. One of our uh, key components of CCDA, Christian Development, is to live in the community. And so when we're on our front steps, people come over and we talk. And so we we had a conversation on our front steps. That was a, a part of the course and what we're talking about. Poverty, uh, Chelsea, who is somebody that grew up in, in, in extreme poverty in America and had a really rough life. And she talks about this. So she and I sit down over a Coke at Lumel Nadi's and uh, we, she tells us all about uh, her growing up poor and what does it look like and how God has brought her out of that. When we talked, the, 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 Jonathan, you you helped me and uh, on, on who, me? the church, the theology <laughs> of the church. So, you know, on, on that particular uh, teaching, Jonathan and I kind of split the teaching. We both talked uh, on that and we got both ideas. And so there's so many people. Racism, Richard Townsell, who's the executive director of our development corporation, he and I dialogued and we t and had talk about racism in America and what does that look like? And as a young black man that grew up in, uh, in a place that oftentimes he went to a Big Ten school where he felt racist and racism that was against him and, and then coming out of that. So you don't just hear from me and my little thinking about it, or not just the ivory tower uh, theological things, or not just the biblical, but the very practical too. And I think that's what the church does. The church brings people to life. You know, oh man, I love church. I mean, if you haven't gotten that yet, and, and by the way, this this is not on the the this is not on what they told me to talk about. But I got to say this: if you happen to be listening today, or if you're listening to this later, and you are not involved in a local church, please go to church Sunday. Pick a church. Go to the closest church to your house. Something you've heard about. I'm not saying go to these big name churches. Just go to church. Go to the closest church by your house, or if you had a family church that you went to on a regular basis and you haven't been back for years, we had somebody come to church Sunday at Lawndale, 
You remember, Pastor Jay, it was so great. Mm -hmm. we, we have this thing of, called prayer time where people stand up in our service every week and share a prayer request or a praise. She stood up in front of everybody in our congregation and said, I am so thankful I grew up at Lawndale Community Church. Now, she hasn't been here in 20 years. Mm -hmm. But now she's got a child and she's raising a child. And she said, I was raised in the church and her, she came with her mom. She brought her mom to church and she just talked about how I'm, I, I've gone back and I've come back to my roots and to my foundation that was in the church. So the church is biblical. The church is God's change agent in the world. The, God has called the people who believe in him to be a part of the local church as well as the church all over the world the universal church of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to encourage you, uh, go to church Sunday and become a part of a local church and be in the church. This is a seminary. We believe in the church and we are active in the church. And I think that's such an important part of, uh, of, of life. You know, the old African proverb says it takes a whole village to raise a child. Unfortunately, in America, there are not many villages left anymore. And what, what, what are the villages? Well, I'll tell you one village, and that's the church. The church is the village. And you go there and you begin to, people know your name, know your name and they, they, they support you. If you're on a basketball team, we go to, if you're in a choir, we, the people from our church will go to you. We had a uh, girl that in our, a girl in our church, about 10, 12 years old, had a uh, recital this week uh, for violin. I think 20 yeah. people from our church went to hear her just to be the, and supportive of her. So the church is the village and it takes a village to raise our children and to be the people that God's called us to be. I get excited about this stuff. So <laughs> where are we, Pastor Jay? Get us back on track here. Hey, that was good. That was good. That was good. You know, I'm never going to stop you giving a promo for the church. So yes, the church is God's chosen change agent for the world. It's a built-in community. It is a place where we get to show the love of God. We get to share mm -hmm. the love of God and we get to be shaped by the love of God. It is a place where we get to live out our Christian witness through community. And so, you know, sitting at home and not connecting with a local church, even if you're sitting at home now, there's no excuse with all this live streaming church, get to church yeah. and be connected. But coach, that that's kind of like a good little segue into this next conversation that's a little more difficult because while the church has done a lot of good and is a good entity, it is God's show, like it is good. Um, there are some tough things as well that we, we know that, when we look through the history of the church, especially the church in America, yeah. where we see some uh, some blots on our, uh, uh, some stains on our garments, you might want to say. And, uh, and one of those is really this issue of race and racism and how much the church has contributed to this conversation, not just historically, but rather recently, you know, during COVID, uh, we saw, you know, while we were stuck at home and scared, staring at our screens and our social media feeds, uh, we all saw what happened with uh, George Floyd and with Breonna Taylor and the response to that, especially from young people in this country, which has sparked kind of a pushback against the church as if we haven't been loud enough or cared enough. And uh, and we get this whole chant of Black Lives Matter from um, from uh, young people who are on the ground saying enough is enough. Um, you talk about race in the church a lot and this theology of race. And I'd love for us just to talk a little bit about it and you got a response and just love to hear a little bit of what you got to say. And I'll jump in too when I got, I definitely got some thoughts on this one. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that, there's, a, there's a lot there. And we, we, we have a whole segment in the seminary now course on race. And of course, let, let's, let's begin with this, is that race, it, there's really no such thing as racism because there's really only one race. And so race is a construct and it was constructed primarily by white people who wanted to, and one of the most basic pieces of this is that white people had to justify in, in America, white people had to justify, and the church was a part of this more often than not, which is so sad, but had to justify two things in America. So if we just look at American history. We had to justify that we people from Europe came to a land and said they discovered it when you can't discover something that people are already there. It was already discovered. It was, it was a land that was inhabited and had to somehow think that because of the color of their skin, even though the human race, there's only one race, they had to construct that there were, we would call them ethnicities. There are ethnicities, but there's only that there were other races. And so the Native American race is, you know, 
actually the misnomer was was Indian. So we stole the land. The land that was here was stolen from the existing people here and we pushed them off their land. The United States had hundreds of treaties, basically broken them all. The other one, of course, is going to another continent and bringing people here from Africa as slaves. And our constitution calls a black person, you could only count a black person for three fifths of a person, not a whole person. And the Declaration of Independence actually uses the word for the native people of this country, Native Americans, and calls them vicious, merciless savages. There's where racism in America really begins. There's a, there's a good book. Um, I actually got it here on my desk, but it's called uh, Stamp from the Beginning. And it's basically a definitive history of racist ideas in America. And, and so I think the church has, has, unfortunately, the most segregated the hours of the week still is Sunday morning. And people often ask me as a white man, you know, well, we want black people to come to our church. We just wanted them to come and, you know, want them to, to know, well, that may be true, may not be true, but let's, re, let's be real about it. Why is there a black church? The reason there's a black church is because white people wouldn't let black people participate fully in their churches. And so Richard Allard Farmer in Philadelphia had to take the black people that were not allowed to be on the main floor and not allowed to take communion with other Christian brothers and sisters. And so, yeah, I think race is one of those places. And so we deal with racism pretty honestly and openly. And, you know, God has called us to love. There's in, in, in Christ, Galatians 3.28, it says there, there is no, uh, there, there's one, we are one, there's, there's not various kinds of people. And so we are all one in the body of Christ, neither, neither Jew or Gentile, African-American, European. There were, there's, there's no people of ethnicity. We're one in Christ. And there's no slave or, or free, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And there is neither male or female but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so when we, when we see that, we begin to understand that the church has a long way to go. Now, can, are there places that things are happening? Absolutely. And I think that's where we need to do it. Now, it, it, I think as, as Pastor Jay just mentioned, it really was exposed quite a bit more with some of this recent things that have happened. The church is divided and we've got a lot of healing to do in the church. Our, the, 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 the American church is a very divided church. And we've, it's time for us to go back to the scriptures and go back to being not, not American culture, but the scriptures. And it's time for us to, to be biblical. It's time for us to out-Bible the politicians. It's time for us to out-Bible people who are, are, are talking things. Let's come back to the word of God and, and see what God says about these things. And we will be amazed. There is one race, the human race, and, and God has created us. Every human being is created in the image of God. We have ethnicity but we have one race. And so for us to construct races and different races so that we could look down upon somebody else. And we have just often just accepted that in a way that is so untrue and it's so detrimental uh, to the body of Christ. We are Christians. We are Christ followers. And my brother and my sister are so significant in my life. That's good. Um, I think I'd like to yeah. push just a little further, Coach. This conversation of kind of returning uh, to the Bible or like really reconnecting. Um, there are some some things that we, you know, here in Lawndale have decided that we want to do um, because we recognize that there has been real damage done to certain groups of people because of racism, even though it's a construct, right? And right. Um, and so since there's been damage done, there needs to be repair as well. Christians are really good at you know saying we need to repent, which means to stop what you're doing, go the other way. But we don't really talk about what it means to repair the damage that was done along the way while we turn it around and go in the other direction. And so I love to have a little bit of a conversation around you know, this conversation around repair that we've been having um, 
um, even like some of the things that we're we're thinking about, but just a way that people who are hearing you saying this and are maybe going, wow, okay, that's a good conversation. What is a practical step for us who people maybe have benefited from racism in this country, especially local churches, because that's just the reality. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's, uh, first of all, one of our core core values of Christian community development is listening and the importance of listening to each other. You know, we often over talk one another. We often, when somebody else is talking, we're thinking about our counterpoint or our argument that we're going to counter instead of really listening. And so one of the most important things, and as a white person living in an African-American community, I, I, I've had this unbelievable blessing of being taught by the people of Lawndale. And I have learned so much. My wife, Ann, and I talk all the time about how blessed we are to, to live in a predominantly African-American community and to be loved in such a way. But I also think that, that one of the things that we're doing, I think that, uh, Jonathan, you're referring to this a little bit, is that we've set up at our church a, a, a fund called the Zacchaeus Fund. And it's really to help African-Americans do better in this life and to do better on earth, in the earthly kingdom. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, heaven's gonna be multiracial, multi-ethnicity, multi-nations, and every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the church. So when we pray thy kingdom come, we're praying that we, that our little area here, our church or whatever, would look like heaven, which is multi-ethnic. It's not going to be of all people like us. So we've set up the Zacchaeus Fund to, to help with that. And it's it's some money that we're putting aside and, and, and people are putting money in to do it. But the key to the Zacchaeus Fund is Zacchaeus. Because you all you all know the story of Zacchaeus, so I don't I don't need to tell it that much. But you know, Zacchaeus is up there trying to find Jesus. Jesus says, Come on down, I'm coming to your house. He goes to Zacchaeus' house, everybody's against it. Tax collectors were hated. They were the hated people. Nobody liked the tax collectors because they cheated the people. And so Jesus goes to his house. Now, Zacchaeus immediately does two things. Jesus didn't tell him to do this. When you have a real encounter with Jesus Christ, your life changes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new person, a new creation. Well, Zacchaeus, we watch him in the gospel of Luke become new because two major things changed. He immediately was convicted of his sin. He was a tax collector and he had cheated many people and he had become wealthy on that. He had become wealthy by cheating other people. There are many, many people in America who have become wealthy on the backs of slaves or on the land of someone else. Those are just two so simple examples. And so Zach, what does Zacchaeus do? He does two things. First, he says to Jesus, Jesus, I am going to give half of my wealth away. I'm going to give half of it away. I know I've cheated people to get rich. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give half of it away to people who don't have, the poor. I'm going to give half of it to the poor, to the, the people that have been marginalized. And then he said, secondly, he said, anybody that I have cheated, I know many of you don't like the word rest, restitution, or other words that begin with R, <laughs> but reparations is what I'm referring to if you didn't catch me. So what does Luke do? He says, anybody I've cheated, whatever I cheated you, I'm gonna give you four times. That's more than restitution, that's a reparation. And what he, what, what, when you and I have encounters with Jesus, we don't live the same. We're new people. And one of those newnesses is we love every human being. We love everyone. And we begin to repent of our sin and we begin to do things different. Wow. Wouldn't it be unbelievable to watch the American church do this? If we could just be real about who we are and particularly when we think about race and racism. And so that that's 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 one piece to living the Christian life in the kingdom of God. It's beautiful, coach. There's one line at the end of that that makes it so powerful. After Zacchaeus says, I will give four times back, mm -hmm. Jesus looks at him and says, Now the kingdom of God has entered this place. Amen. Now the kingdom of heaven is here, right? Like he, he, he says, now that you get it, that like it's not just enough 
to just admit that you were wrong, but there needs to be uh, a, a tangible proof that things have changed um, by the way you're repairing. Then he says, ah, now the kingdom of God is here. And so I just, I just, I love hearing the story. I just love hearing the stories that kids over and over again, because it tells us what our actual responsibility is as the church. And I think we're all, I mean, race is a clear cut one, but there are ways in every other way. We can talk about men and patriarchy against women and like all the different ways that we all need to do some repair work. Um, uh, but America, we know that that race has been a big a big issue for us, and so I'm glad that it's being brought up. So you definitely want to see and watch this beautiful, beautifully done seminary now class that just goes head on into issues like theology of race, theology of poverty, and theology of justice. So, Coach, we got a few questions that have come in, so I definitely want to get to them before we yep. run out of time here. So, uh, first one, I'm going to start with uh, one that came in towards the end because I think it. It's a good question to start with. It, it says this, is there any advice that you'd have for a church member who wants the church leaders to see things in the ways that we're talking about, but it's hard to know where to begin? How do you begin this conversation in your church, talking to your church leaders when you're not the one making the decisions? Yeah, wow, that's, that, is, that is such, and you know, I know this is a trite statement when we say often when a question comes in, that's a great question, but that really is a great question because that's, hopefully that's where our hearts are. We always do it humbly, you know, uh, and, and if any of you are on here right now and you're feeling guilty, that's my fault. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying, I, my goal is to help you to live righteously. And when we live righteously, we repent for things that we've done wrong. So I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but we've got to own who we are. So if you're somebody in the church that maybe you're getting it a little bit more than your church leaders, um, there's several things that you can do. There's a there's a number of books. Uh, one, one, one book that is 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 really good. I mean, I mean, Pastor Jay's written a book called The Church Forsaken. And it deals deals with some of these things. It's a great way to do it. But another book is in that there's actually uh, is it's Unsettling Truths by Soon Chan Ra and by uh, Mark Charles. And that book talks about some of the uh, uh, the the truths of American culture and even the church and how uh, we haven't owned up to that. Uh, Daniel Hill has a book. Uh, called called entitled White Lies. There, th there's many books out there today, uh, and I, I don't have time to mention them all. That are about maybe racial reconciliation. Uh, Latasha Morrison has written a book, Be the Bridge, and that's a really good book of how how we can our churches can come together to make a difference. So uh, these are these are some of the books. So I think reading a book that you've read, you might give it to your pastor and say, you know, I read this book and it really has helped me. Um, I think another way is maybe saying, hey, could we have a book club and let's read some books together? That's another thing. But I think going in and having an honest dialogue and letting people know how you've changed. You know, I used to act, I used to think this way, but you know, um, God's been working in my life and I'm seeing things a little bit differently. So I think honest dialogue, um, you know, we, we, we speak the truth, but we should always speak the truth in love, as Paul tells us in Ephesians, that we should speak the truth in love in Ephesians 4. So those would just be a, a few small ways to get started. Um, I think also um, spending some time cross-culturally and across ethnicities, you know, visiting churches uh, that are, are different, visiting a Korean church, visiting a Latino church, visiting an African-American church um, can, can make a difference, getting to know people, building some bridges, churches re, can, can partner together. So there's a lot of ways to just get on, uh, it started. Another book that was written um, by Michael Emerson and uh, Christian Smith uh, is, is a book about, uh, Jonathan, what's the name of that book? I forget the title of it. Do you remember it off the top of your head? Um, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Mike Emerson and Christian Smith. I, I can't believe I can't remember the title of it. Um, oh, the um, I'll, I'll probably think of it before. Somebody put it in the chat if you if you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, my friend uh, Michael Emerson is going to say, "Coach, you can't remember the name of my book," but I, it, it slipped me right now. Divided by faith. Divided by faith. Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, that's a great book. And it's and it's been around for probably close to 15, 20 years. And it's really helped. I know several white suburban pastors that read that that said it changed their lives when they began to understand that. So those are a few ways. That's good. You made me jog my memory. Um, so another question. Um, this one was kind of submitted as we were imploring people to be a part of a local church. And I thought it was an interesting response. And the question began with, what if churches don't mm -hmm. want you? That was all it said. And uh, and so I asked uh, our behind the scenes friend Chaz there to try to get a little bit more background. Um, and, you know, this person says I was officially excommunicated from two churches because my daughter's father was black. And then another church I really wanted to serve in told me I wasn't qualified to do anything in their church. Right. Um, and I think the question is just like, what do I do? Like, I'm trying to be proactive in my connection to church, but the church doesn't seem to want me. Well, you know. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say as a pastor, I am very sorry. I'm sorry that any church of Jesus Christ treated you that way. Uh, we as a church are to be welcoming. We're to have our arms out and welcoming people. Jesus said, come to me in Matthew 11, all who are weary and burdened, come to me. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, I'd have to say if you, if, you, if you have some churches that you've, you've been involved in and they don't want you, then look for another church. I mean, I, I, I hate to even have to say that, but that's probably the case. I don't want you to have to fight every Sunday when you go to church. The church is for everyone and the church is to be there. And, and, and you know, there are some quote unquote seeker churches that that's not a term that's quite as popular as it used to be. But, you know, <laughs> quite frankly, you know, we, we at Lawndale, we try to be a church for the unchurched. And so we really want people who don't have church history to come to our church. And and one of the one time we were all invite, we have a thing, we invite people to church and somebody came up to me and said, coach, you know, I've been inviting my friends to come to church. They said, they don't want to go to your church and they don't want to come to our church. And I said, well, why? Well, what do you mean? They said, yeah, they we, they don't want to come to our church because we got all the drug dealers and the, and the gang bangers and the prostitutes. That's the church they go to. And so I stood up on a chair and I said, fantastic. I want to be known as a church that a prostitute can come to. I want to be known as a church that a drug dealer can come to. And there we're not we're not unique in that. There's a lot of churches that feel that way. So, you know, even even I was reading in in the book of Acts this morning my wife Ann and I were reading in the book of Acts and it says that you know when they went to they went to some places and they had to shake this the dust off their their uh their feet and you have to move on. So unfortunately, if churches are like that that you're with um, I think look for something, look for another church that would be more welcoming. And a word for all of us who are pastors of churches, you know, um, we're not above that. Um, just be, being quite candid and honest, Pastor Jay, you remember, we, we had a young man who came to our church. I was thinking the same thing. That long ago. And uh, unbeknownst to Pastor Jay and I, um, he, he was a young man that had his pants way down, you know, his belt wasn't working and it was halfway down his backside and some some wonderful caring person in our church a woman went up and said young man pull your pants up well he left that day and he told the youth pastor that he was working with he said that the, the only person that spoke at me at church that day was a woman that told me to pull my pants up i don't want to go back to that church that happened on our watch at lawndale community church and we're sorry for that and so we are made up of, of people and we and but that gave us a teaching point. Both Pastor Jay and I have talked about that in our own in our in our sermons at, at Lawndale to try to help people to know that. So we we're constantly teaching. But my my heart goes out to you that any church would would not let you come in. But I know that's the case. And of course, um, you know, people of color, uh, poor people, they have this experience in America often and uh, that it's that's that's a part of the disobedience of our churches today hey amen and and i just encourage you not to um as this is a very bad metaphor when people say it to throw the baby out with the bathwater. i don't know where we got that from why are we throwing babies out but you know this whole idea of that that is the church no that is a church and so the church wants you that church might need to grow some and and or or figure out what's going on with 
the ethos there in which they're not being loving. But please don't cast a broad net of that's the church. You know, in my book, Church Forsaken, that's what I talk about is that no matter how unique you know, a church can be, everyone has some kind of an experience with the church. And what we've got to do as members of a church is also speak to our fellow pastors, fellow churches, and say, hey, what you do over there, it does have some effect on us because people come to us with this church hurt, like having baggage that they're bringing. And so we've got to be loving to everyone when they come. But I pray until we're able to get that stuff together that that you'll just continue to seek and recognize that God exists, that there are churches that that are really living out the love of Christ, and keep seeking for them. And I and I pray that I pray for your daughter as well, who um, I'm sure has felt some real pain from those type of things. That uh, that that'll be healed as well. Uh, keep looking, keep searching, and we'll be praying for you as you look. Um, all right, we only got a few minutes left, so. Coach, we have someone who said they'd love to talk to you more about the master's program and community development because they are very interested in the program. How do they get in contact with you if they are interested in the master's program in CCD? Well, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, uh, you can email me through uh, Northern Seminary. Uh, and uh, my email is just wgordon at seminary.edu through Northern, and it's very easy to do. But I think the other thing is get in touch with Northern Seminary and uh, they in, start looking at it. But I'd be more than happy to have a phone conversation with you. And once you uh, send an email, we get we get the process going and talking. Um, you know, we can set up a time for talk. I think the master's program in Christian community development does two things. It gives you a biblical background. And so we, we, we've uh, worked at it at um, We've worked at it at Northern Seminary uh, to be able to get core courses. You know, there you, you have core, you have Old Testament, and New Testament. You have understanding the church. Uh, there's a number of courses, but then there's seven core courses in Christian community development, like. Uh, Poverty. We there's a course on poverty. There's a course on racism and reparations and what does that look like. There's a course called Nurturing Your Call: Keys to Longevity and Ministry. And so there's there's seven core courses of which I teach most most of them. Pastor Jay and a couple others co-teach with me. Dr. Marshall Hatch, pastor at Newmont Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church, is also one of our professors and is a professor at Northern. And so we do uh, a number of ways to do that. But what we're going is to help you go do Christian community development in your community, but to do it from a biblical standpoint. One of the things about Christian community development is that we are biblically based. We base all of our principles straight out of scripture, and we are serious about living out the good news of Jesus Christ and the, and the biblical mandates that he, he has given us there. Yes, thanks so much. Thanks so much. I'm a, a testament to the beauty of uh, Northern Seminary and the CCD program. Um, yeah, I was a pastor practicing Christian community development, but it was going through Northern that really helped me to form my real theology around it, to get some real core practice, and most of all, to build a network of fellow pastors, brothers and sisters, living this out in communities all over the world, um, not just in America, our friends over in Africa and all over are, are in class with us, and man, I learned so much from them, and so I would encourage anyone, if you're interested, please reach out to Coach. And really, uh, it does make a difference. Uh, it definitely has made a difference for me so much. So I jumped back in to get my doctorate. So you got to do it fast. Well, I have a doctoral program. There's one more question I'm going to ask, Coach, just because I think it's an important one for some people who are listening. And you can just give us a quick answer to this one. What can suburban or rural churches do in this conversation? Uh, are there any words you have for them or a book you might be able to suggest to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks. That, uh, and thanks for that question. It's such an important question that we're asking is uh, how, can, how can we be part? Basically, how can we can be a part of the solution? John Perkins and I wrote a little book and this is this book is being is meant to be read in two hours and most people can do it. And it's called Do All Lives Matter? It's a question. You know, some people respond negative to Black Lives Matter. Sidebar, one of our pastors was asked on the, one day by a white person, you know, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? And they were th the white person was saying, you know, I'm, I'm sick of this term. And this pastor looked at them as Kerry Casey and he's, he looked at them and he said, well, I'm black and I matter. <laughs> Simple. 
Case, case closed. But so this book, uh, Do All Lives Matter, is is a book that is a starter book. You can read it in two hours, but it kind of lays out the problems. One chapter has got a, a, a number of solutions in it. And so it's it's been a good starter book for people to read, as well as some of the others I already mentioned. But I think reading is part of it. But, but um, you know, uh, when we were on, you know, when, when nobody could go to church except through uh, social media, we had some uh, a person in Valparaiso, Indiana, start watching our our church service every week. All of a sudden, one day they show up at church. They wanted they wanted to experience what they were. They 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 came. So come and visit. You know, don't be afraid of 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 problems that are out there. And also look around your own community. Who Who's less fortunate in your own community? Who Who is struggling? You know, it may be, you know, the, the old joke used to be that there every little town had a town drunk. Well, if your town has a town drunk, begin build a relationship with them. That's what Jesus did. He got involved in people's lives. So I would say get involved in the lives around you, um, and and if if you find people who are hurting, you know, come alongside. It may be somebody just in your church that's going through a divorce and they're being shunned. You know, walk with that person, walk with that couple, and and be there. So um, g- get on the road to be part of the solution to uh, the bottom line: loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's the greatest commandment in scripture. And uh, it's it's so, so wonderful to be able to do that. Thanks so much, coach. All right, everybody. Well, we have come to the end of our time. A couple of quick reminders. If you weren't on earlier, we are giving away a one-year subscription to Seminary Now for a chance to win it, all you have to do is share this live stream on Facebook and you'll be automatically entered into the drawing to win. So go ahead and start sharing this live stream on Facebook so that your friends can see it and you can be entered into that drawing. Also, check out Seminary Now. You can sign up to view Coach's course and many more at seminarynow.com with a free seven-day trial. Just You can also inquire about group subscriptions or churches and not-for-profits by emailing sales, S-A-L-E-S, at seminarynow.com. All right. Thank you so much, Coach. Any last words before we sign off? Well, thank you so much for... Uh... Uh, being with us today, and uh, and you can see this this rich relationship that Pastor Jay and I have of pastoring together. I'm so thankful for him, and and we we love working together. We love pastoring, and we've enjoyed having you with us today. Hopefully, uh, you know we've been able to give you a little bit of a taste of things. We'd love to have you. If you're ever in Chicago, come by and visit Lawndale Community Church. Our website is just lawndalechurch.org. We'd love to get to know you. And uh, we're not so big that you, if you come to our church, that we won't shake your hand. We'll see you. We'll give you a high five and a fist bump and whatever it is that that uh, you're doing. If you so thanks, for, thanks for the privilege of sharing uh, our love for Christ and our experience of living out the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, Ann and I, uh, we have loved our lives and we continue to love them here on the west side of Chicago in the North Lawndale community. And thank you for joining us here on Seminary Now in this uh, special time together. Thank you so much. Thank you to each of the viewers for tuning in. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the comments. Please continue to share on Facebook and, uh, and go ahead and get your subscription to Seminary Now. There are so many great uh, classes, thinkers, writers, theologians, activists that you definitely want to get connected to. Thank you again, Coach, my buddy. Man, it's always good to have good conversation and dialogue. And I'm going to sign off with a sentence that opens and closes Coach's book, Real Hope in Chicago, because now I can say it. I love living in Lawndale. All right. Thank y'all. Have a good night.